So I'd like to be joined by Hubert. Uh, Hubert, could you give us a bit of an introduction to yourself and your, your farming system here? Hi, uh, this is, I'm Hubert Nicholson. Um, we're farming uh, 80 suckler cows here. Um, we're taking all the progeny to finish to beef and uh, we're in the middle of calving at the moment and um, we're hoping it's all going to finish up well. Yeah, you have some fantastic cows and, and calves uh, on the ground. How's calving going for you at this time? Yeah, no, at the moment we're, uh, we're very happy things. We've got four sets of twins on the ground, so uh, the numbers are looking good. Brilliant. And um, everything is coming out well, and they're lively and healthy. Great which job. Is a great bonus. We're currently under shelter because there's a bit, of, a bit of rain falling today. I think we're all saying our prayers that uh, we get a bit of sunshine, but uh, you're looking forward to getting them turned out? Yeah, absolutely. I, ho I do have uh, about 25 out at the moment in various bits and pieces in very small numbers. Um, but yeah, with the sheds are starting to get a bit full now and we'd like to get the rest out maybe in the next 10 days um, as soon as they calve, more or less. Great job. I see some fantastic stock over in the fire shed. You, you bring them to, uh, you do bull beef, steer beef? The and we finish about 50 males. Um, we, uh, we buy in a couple to fill up the quota. Uh, so we do um, half of them as bulls and half of them as bullocks. So uh, the bulls go in October at 20 months and then the, the bullocks go um, probably in the next month or so, as uh, going around about 27 months or 28 months. Great job, and uh, I know the quality of stock, you use plenty of AI, so we'll come back to that maybe in, in a second. But over to John, progressive genetics, but also a, a staunch Calvin man with a, a few Charolais up in Calvin. Oh yes, yeah, breed beef breeding the brave visor with uh, progressive genetics, uh, Sokla farm, or farm with 40 cows, predominantly Charlie and limousine. Um, I suppose I was a Charlie man through and through, but uh, uh, my daughter influenced me slightly to change a bit of colour, but uh, still a blue jersey. Great job. And, and what's, what system do you run? You bring them through to beef or are you selling the stores? Or? Uh, probably suckler's to stores. Uh, more, um, we run 40 cows, um, uh, selling weanlands. I tend to probably sell a bit more towards the springtime. Um, I suppose coming from years ago, it was predominantly shippers we got. We were, we were selling through export and uh, calves were going off farm usually to the shippers and that allowed me maybe to feed on into a slightly heavy, heavier wean and selling maybe kind of January time, usually February. And, yeah. So are you, cav are you calving at the minute then or are you calving more? Uh, no, we're calving yeah. well on now at the minute, okay. we're probably 80% calved. Yeah. Uh, I think there's 10 cows left to calve. Touch wood, uh, all gone well. Um, 28 calves on the ground, 28 cows calved. We had one cow aborted our race that threw a calf probably halfway through. Again, touch wood, so far that's the thing. And look, for me, big priority Cavanese facility, the two main factors when I'm picking bulls. Uh, working mostly on my own, well, myself and my daughter, and they have to be quiet, easy to handle. Jack's hanging on the wall, it hasn't come down yet this year. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and hopefully it stays that way for the rest of the calf well, season. No, I hate crossed. talking about these things yeah, because it can change fairly yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. But look, as you said, uh, the part-time nature of beef farming is, is very important and we'll touch on the, the aspects of that and labour saving and technology going forward. But I might get an introduction from you, Kieran. Uh, well known in the social media aspect, uh, grace the field for, for me, Jay, as well, but you also do a bit, of, a bit of farming as well. Yeah, John, so um, I'm farming about 20 miles away from Aaron's Screen. Uh, so it's 50 cow, 100% AI, spring cabin, suckler herd very tight, we do Everton calved in about seven, eight weeks, fingers crossed. Everton through to the beef then. Bulls on the grid at 15 months, aiming for about warts and all, I suppose, high 380, 390 kilo carcass, and uh, heifers before second winter. Some years we'll go off grass if the price is good, or the years we'll bring them in, fatten them up. Um, predominantly continental genetics, Angus on heifers, like John, part-time, so, our farm decisions are about convenience as much as they are about you know, profitability and pushing the thing. But we have a good mix at the moment. Great job. It's, it's great to see some variety, but a lot of top, uh, top producers here, which is, which is great. And we're going to get a lot of information. Rose, might get you to give us a bit of introduction. I'm sure most people watching will, will know of you, but uh, a little brief introduction would be great. Yeah, I run the beef breeding program for NCVC, the National Cattle Breeding Centre. And um, that's the breeding program for both Munster Bovine and Progressive Genetics. Very good, very good. I think a, a common theme there was about keeping it simple and keeping it easy, the part-time nature of, of suckler beef uh, breeding and, and indeed finishing and farming. I might go to you, Kieran, from a, an ag tech perspective. Ag technology is very prominent in the dairy industry and the dairy farming. 
it's it's reaching the, the suckler farm a, a, yeah. a lot more to safe to say and i know hubert has a camera up above us here so we, we might come to hubert for his comments after but at home what are you doing from a technology perspective for labor saving yeah definitely so we are calving best part of 55 cows in eight weeks all of us working off farm um so we made two big investments in last in recent years in technology the first one was the calving camera um, I wouldn't be without it now. It enables us to, you know, it, it's, it's fairly straightforward and obvious what it does for us. Before it was up during the night checking them two and three times. Now you have full control over the calving process. I will say we've gone away from the harder calving bulls, but our weaning weights haven't suffered and our carcass weights haven't suffered. We're also 100% AI and when I say that a lot of people kind of shirk, how do you do it in eight weeks? We do a bit of synchronizing, but only about eight, seven or eight cows a year. Uh, we use the moo call heat detection, we have two collars, so we actually do no manual heat detection now. Um, we let the collars do everything. The first year I got it, I was a bit sceptical. We were kind of standing in the corner of the field watching to see what cows actually bulling. And after about two weeks, I just let the collars away, and that's three years ago. And as well as reducing labour, I think time is your biggest asset as a, as a suckler farmer, particularly part-time. It actually has increased our conception rates as well. We've actually increased from kind of low to mid 80s up to touching 95% conception, which is tricky in 100% the eye. We have no stock bull. So there's no clean up bull in to uh, pick up where we've kind of missed the, missed the boat. So two of the best um, investments we've made have been in technology. Yeah, it's brilliant to see and the importance of it from a, a time perspective. You know, t time is money, as they say. And yeah. um, when you look back, people often say they wanted more time. So it's great to see that, 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 you, that you're getting that benefit. I might bring in Rose and John just on technology. What we're talking about here is we've talked about technology from electrics perspective. But a key technology that's important on farm is breeding and genetics and getting your artificial insemination correct. So from a suckler perspective, Rose, and you know what you're all doing in NCBC, getting the right bulls into Progressive and, and Munster, what is the focus from a breeding perspective uh, in terms of bulls with NCBC? I suppose the focus is to first of all um, select bulls that um, have the bulls have a specific purpose in mind even from the point of selection um, and if you take suckler farmers what do, what do they want from these bulls so um, some farmers want to breed their own replacements for example so we have a special you know maternal program specifically to breed bulls and to select bulls for, for replacements um, then the wheeling producer he, he's, he's really interested just in the terminal side, so he wants very good weight gain and he wants early shape. And then the finisher and the, and the guy selling stores, he also wants excellent weight gain. He also wants excellent shape, which is ultimately carcass confirmation, but it can come a little bit later for him. So it's really about selecting bulls for the specific purposes. And then um, transcending all of that is really the calving. Um, because difficult calving costs a lot of money for everybody. So trying to achieve everything a suckler farmer wants to achieve um, and minimising the level of calving difficulty. Fantastic. And you, you mentioned a, an American uh, term that's used for a particular type of, and I'm going to let you touch on it, but I think maybe Kieran might have highlighted it. That's why he's getting less, there's no issue with calving difficulty. He's put more of a focus on calving ease, but he's still hitting that kind yeah, of Yeah, Kieran hit the nail on the head. Um, the term the Americans use is a curve bender, um, but that's exactly what Kieran described his experience of using AI. Um, no trouble calving, um, still achieving his weaning weights, and and still achieving his yearling weights. Yeah, excellent. I, I, we come back to you, John, maybe on the, the use of AI, um, the importance of it we've touched on. Uh, we've mentioned technology, but from your perspective, you're, you're part-time, you're, mm -hmm. you're working, you do have a, an exceptional advisor at home, but how are you managing the, the, the use of AI on your farm? Well, to be honest, uh, I suppose we've touched a bit earlier on in synchronization, but that's key for me on my farm because like, d the nature of, of our business with, with the genetics and with spring, we get very busy in the springtime. So wh where my AI comes in is on the, on the early calving. Like, I like to kind of get calved into January, into February, uh, as we come into the middle of January and get calved fairly fast. I try to get uh, the end of April, by the beginning of April, the middle of April, that I have a lot of cows back in calf as they're going out at the start before we get busy with AI and, and the breeding season takes over for us. Um, I'm using synchronization. I'm going in with generally 10 to 15 cows in a pack doing two to three runs of synchronization over a couple of weeks. AI and everything across the board. 
and then they're gone and get it, it's allowing me to run a very tight re, very tight calving uh, um, calving pattern in the spring I get my cows calf quick uh, I like to by the time I like by the time we're going to grass that I need to be finished. I need to be finished calving by early April, mid April, because after that, my priorities have moved somewhere else. And it has to stay simple. Calving is a big, big priority with me. Um, uh, docility is another very big priority because most of the time I'm on my own. I need stock that I can handle. I need stock that I can handle at night. I need stock that I can get in easy and that I can herd easy. Um, they would be the two things, but synchronization is key for me to get the level of AI into the herd that I'm, that I'm able to do. Brilliant. I, I think it's a, it's a common common feature when you're talking to exceptional producers and, and breeders alike and farmers. Rose, just touching on that kind of that climate element of it. So we hear that the, the beef cow is very inefficient and uh, we have too many beef cows or too many cows in Ireland. But we hear in recent weeks that kind of folks around food has changed and the conversation has changed. We produce beef exceptionally well in this country. Um, what can we do going forward? I know we discussed a little bit about kind of the efficiencies and previously we might have spoken on profitability and it was all profit, but now there's that climate and carbon element. What can we do from a, a breeding and management perspective at age of first calving and so on, or finishing age? What, what, what's, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Sure, well I suppose the first thing is we all eat and we all like to eat. So um, food production is important. And I think Ireland is one of the best countries in the world um, where we can produce food sustainably be it beef or milk. Um, so then from a, from a beef point of view, um, we're really, really lucky actually, because everything we can do um, from a breeding point of view that will improve sustainability will also improve profitability. And we're very lucky in that one. We're not being asked to do something, you know what I mean, it's going mm. to cost us more money. Um, so here, you know, if we just think about genetics. What can we do from a genetic point of view to improve sustainability and therefore profitability on a suckler farm. And it's all about efficiency, okay? And it's all about having that animal working for every day it's there. So we want to really reduce the ones that are, you know, waste around the place. So if you, you know, you mentioned it there. So if you talk about fertility, calving a two is a big one. Getting a calf every 365 days um, is another big one. Um, making sure that cow um, can, can feed her own calf on her own, um, feed her own calf and go back in calf because we want another calf in another 365 days and stay in the farm then for as many lactations as possible. So all those things around fertility, that's, a, that's an efficient animal, therefore a sustainable animal, therefore more profitable. So that's kind of on the maternal side. If we look then on the terminal side, we need animals that can um, grow very quickly um, really utilize grass. Um, again, in Ireland, we're really lucky with our climate. We're really lucky with our land type. Um, we're one of the best countries in the world to grow grass. Um, so we need animals to be able to, to utilize grass, um, put on as much weight as possible, and do it as quickly as possible. Um, and the big thing for sustainability is to um, reduce the age at slaughter. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do from a genetic point of view to improve all of those things. Um, the other thing we're looking at from a genetic point of view is feed efficiency. And unfortunately, something we can't measure on farms um, because we just don't have the technology. But we're lucky in Ireland to have um, ICBF and to have Tully. And we have a facility in Tully uh, to, me to measure the feed efficiency of the progeny of our AI bulls. Um, so if we have information on the AI bulls, they're the bulls that are producing the greatest amount of progeny out there. And they're also the bulls that, the, that would be the sire of the stock bulls. Um, the, you know, the pedigree breeders sell to commercial farmers. Um, so even though we're not getting a lot of data on feed efficiency, we're getting it on the important animals that feed down along the, the food chain. Um, and feed efficiency is a big one because we, we need animals that can put on as much weight as possible um, by eating as, li as little as possible. And we found big variation by, you know, in different bloodlines. Um, and then the other thing we're doing here in Ireland, um, and again it's happening in Tully, is actually measuring the amount of methane an animal is producing. And uh, we are starting to see differences between different genetics. Um, so um, two animals doing exactly the same thing from a weight gain point of view and a feed efficient point of view, but one is producing much more methane than the other. Wow. Right. 
I think it's fantastic from a from an industry perspective and a, a farmer on the ground to hear that that's the focus from a from a you know a breeding perspective and get the right genetics on farm because I think we'll all say from a beef industry there's a lot more we can do from an efficiency perspective to uh, improve our carbon footprint but farmers are very resilient and open open to doing that and I think uh, increasing the use of AI on farm with those. Uh, breeding targets and genetics, I think, is a, a sure way of, of doing that. Feed and efficiency will be yes. the next. Like feed efficiency going forward. Like from my own point of view, I'm trying to feed it. It's costing me probably, I think it was in the journal last week, over 1,200 to keep a suckler cow. Most of that's feed. So I need a suckler cow that I can put in when she's weaned and just really restrict her without losing condition. And then also finishing bulls. How many price increases has there been in the last six months on, on ration? You know. Mm. So feed efficiency is key for us. I think it's great that AI companies are looking at it, but farmers need to consider it more. Um, like if you look at the, the strides that were made in feed efficiency in the, in the last century on monogastric, where they are at now, what they've done with breeding mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. get feed efficiency. And we need to start thinking like that too. If you go to North America, countries, feedlock countries, I know we're not one of those, we don't want to be one of those, but it's no harm to start thinking like that. Because feed is 70, 75% of your variable costs is to feed the animal. Yeah. And in a ruminant, a lot of that is maintenance. So you're mm -hmm. not even getting any gain from it. So that needs to be, um, that needs to come to the forefront of our minds. And as Rose said, anything that makes us money in general is better for the climate too. Yes. So it's a win-win. Yeah, win -win. and I, I think the, the current uh, crisis we're seeing across Europe and you know the food supply and shortage uh, predicted, um, it'll change our focus as well. I think a simple one you talk about feed is, is silage quality. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going to come into a busy period of making silage and the cost of meal and concentrates. But I know Hubert with finishing uh, exceptional animals and yourself would be uh, certainly uh, focused on improving your, your silage quality. John, from a, a climate perspective, I have to kind of go around the table and ask that question because it is so topical. Um, it is important to the beef herd, it's important to the country, it's important to everyone. But from a beef farmer's perspective, what, what, does that put, what frame of mind does that put you in and what do you think you can do to improve well, their Well, again, it's everything that Rose spoke about there is, is about uh, feed efficiency, it's about uh, days to slaughter. Uh, I suppose the, the one thing that's really uh, made it stand out for me from a, uh, an environmental or sustainability point of view has been through the beef scheme and the calf way, mm. where I have found, like, you're sitting there looking at your way sheet after you've done your recording, like, and you've got a 700 kilo cow, 200 day wean and weight, 270, 280, 300 kilos. And then you've got a 550 kilo cow that's standing beside her with a 200 day wean and weight of 350 kilos. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like she's 30% lighter and she's producing the same calf. I'm assuming 30% less feed, 30% less methane, 30% saving yeah. all around. Like, you know what? I think they were we can make the efficiencies. Um, look at coming from a Charlie background it's hard not to have big cows do you know yeah, what I mean yeah, it's yeah. hard not to like big cows sometimes yeah. too but it's only when you see it down on paper <coughs> you know when you've got these the, the, these practical functional function and this would be a lot as I suppose Rose would have influenced a lot of the, dare I say to change of breeding selection on our farm through sires that uh, she has selected uh, but Definitely on the beep sheet on, on, on your, your weaning report there, it's, it's, it's stand out. But any, any farmer, they can look down and it's there to be seen. Like. Yeah, I think that, that point there you mentioned about seeing it on the paper mm -hmm. makes you make that decision. And I know there had been some uh, confusion or different opinions on some of the schemes that have been ran, but certainly we have to, you know, credit where credit is due. Some of the schemes that have been ran have encouraged people for best management, best practice, weighing your animals, vaccinating and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And I, I'd agree with you. It's hard to make a decision uh, unless you've measured it. And when you've measured it, you can then manage it, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I know when probably a lot of farmers probably look at these schemes, including myself, it's, it's just another job sometimes. But, like, uh, I find, look, BDGP definitely for me has, has made a difference that um, I'm a bit like here and I, I can roll around and look at the cameras and say in bed at night now Calvin and Robert, before this it had to be on the end of a yoke clicking on every one of them you know. Yeah. Uh, we've, eliminated, we've eliminated caesareans on the farm touch wood for having had one in several years now from having several every year. You have one tonight uh, now. <laughs> yeah, touch wood, touch wood. <laughs> so that's the touch wood bit but uh, um, Look at it, to me it's just keep it simple, I'm working off farm, I want, as Kieran Todd has spoken on the vaccines, scour plans, simple things that make it easy for me to work and keep it off, which is 
a bit of technology, a bit of uh, technology vaccination, genetics, Cavanese, and it frees me up to go and do other things. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. So as we're coming up to the to the breeding season, Hubert, uh, and I'm going to go to the other guys to, to ask them, what, what's at the forefront of your mind ahead of the upcoming breeding season from a, a bull selection perspective, and what bulls have you got in mind? Um, so my for the bulls that I'll be using on my heifers, um, I'll probably be, well, the, the, the main focus for me would be I'd like to have a heifer at the end of the day that I'd be able to keep in the herd. So I'll be looking for milk, um, a reasonable frame, a reasonable size frame of a cow. So um, Simmentals or um, Charolais. Um, so the Simmentals I'll be using, probably be thinking about using, will be Erp, uh, Frosty King, uh, Gucci for easy calving. And then possibly if I had a, a slightly smaller heifer that I was a slightly worried about, I might go with Nell, the limousine Nell. And then on the, uh, the cows, um, I could be going a slightly off centre and I'll be looking at some of the French straws. Excellent, yeah, I must take note of them because uh, I wouldn't mind a herd of cows that look like yours, so uh, that's good breeding there. John, what, what about you? What's well, the sure, again, for me, the, the focus for me is going to be on, on Cavanese. It's, it's, it's the main priority, Cavanese and Macility. Uh, for the heifers, for me, it's, it's Nell and Grenache across the board. Uh, the reliability, like the rock solid, I have never any problems. Uh, every heifer on farm this year has calved on her own. Um, going through the cows, uh, I'd be using a bit of nob. Um, uh, Charlie Wise, Lapon, look, he's, he's a little superstar in my opinion. Um, a big fist and fan in the past. Uh, currently, um, Lapon, Orby, Orby is a bull I like a lot. I think he's easy calf and he's doing a really good job. I think he's, he's, he's going to go that way. What I'm looking forward to. Um, uh, Ricky, a new fist and son, uh, look, I have no calves of him, he's a bull I'll be using now in the spring. Um, uh, Omega, I'm probably going to try a wee bit, I like, his, I like his maternal background because I still like to keep a few pedigree Charlies and, and Charlie females around the farm. Um, uh, I like his maternal background that's in, a, 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 in, a, in Omega, he's Epernay out of a VMO rose, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Big fan of VMO, have yeah. VMO heifers, I think, to probably the it's got females I have, I think, the temperament yeah. and uh, they're just super cows. Brilliant, super cows. A, lot of, a lot of white cattle there, the advisor at home will, will, will well want to see, see more it's reds. It's, 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 it's got to be a bit of a, a traumatic situation <laughs> around our farm, it's like playing for two different teams, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, the best of luck with it, Kieran. I know there's uh, years and years of genetics uh, and AI breeding in your herd, so what's the focus for the upcoming breeding season and bulls to use? So like John, I'd be first and foremost calving difficulty, matching it to the cow obviously, but around about eight, nine percent tops for cows and then heifers as low as possible. Um, reliability with that is important as Rose said. Slight bit different then, so we chase hybrid vigor big time. Um, so as you said, my, my dad has been AI since I was a tot, so all of our cows nearly are born on the farm from AI sires. So we full parentage on them. So we'll then go in with a sire that isn't in her mix from okay. a breed point of view. Um, and it's, wor it's worked well for us and my breeding decisions are going to be always with a cow in mind to get it to get a cow you know for a daughter um, and so far in Cavan we've had something like 80% bulls it doesn't always happen <laughs> but like the bulls that progressive have to be fair yeah. have, we, we'd always be looking at carcass weight as well we're not going extreme so like if I have a good cemental limousine cross cow she'd get a salaire you know um, in terms of bulls, exactly the same smentals as you, Hubert, the three smentals you mentioned, uh, Charlie, Le Pond. you haven't got any fists and straws lying around for me, have you? <laughs> oh in no, the back of the freezer somewhere. A lad like me always has yeah, a bit of stuff hidden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fiston and Le Pond were our two last year, and look, doing the business, definitely. Um, limousine, Nell, mm -hmm. um, use a bit of short horn to try and get that Roni heifer to sell to an accountant with a big wallet for 4,000, but unfortunately <laughs> got bulls. Um, but I like the calves. Yeah, really good calves. I, I think it was Firefox was the mm. short horn. Uh, Angus then on heifers. We used three Angus last year. Fergal, uh, is it Maverick Rose, and mm -hmm. then RGZ. Yeah, bouncing up, sucking. Great job. So, as I said, it'd be hybrid vigor, Cavanese, and then like all the bulls I mentioned there have good carcass weight figures. So if you get a bull, 
you're not too bad. You know, you're still going to do the business in the finishing shed. Brilliant. And as Rose mentioned, uh, planning is very important. And those three guys certainly have, uh, have their plans in place and yeah. ready for a, a, a successful breeding season. And we wish them all the best of luck. But uh, Rose, if you want to just kind of pull that together, the importance of planning and AI and bull selection and calves on the ground, how, much, how important is that for the industry? Oh, it's really important because um, if you plan, you'll get the outcome right. Um, and that's the secret. So I suppose if you take suckler farmers that are planning to use AI for the season, I think the big thing is, um, to the first thing I'll say, I suppose, don't compromise in calving, especially with maiden heifers. Um, so, and if you're calving a two, you need, need to use exceptionally easy calving, like Kieran is doing there with his, with his Angus bulls. But just don't compromise it on maiden heifers. You can use more difficult calving bulls then as the seed, you know what I mean, as, as the parity goes up. And get to know your cows, know your cattle. Um, that, that's really secret. Um, and I suppose at the end of the day, think about the overall output from the farm as opposed to uh, going for broke um, with, with one super calf. Um, so think about the overall outcome. So if you're a wheeling producer um, and you can calve those heifers a little bit earlier, if you, if you can get more cows and calf, more live calves on the ground, if that means an extra wheeling you're going to the mart with, it's very hard to make up that with, with, um, with super individuals. So think about more calves and an extra wheeling to go to the mart. And then if you're finishing, think about the extra beef then you'll have to sell to the factory. So look at the overall output of the farm, um, I'd say would be my one, you know, um, summing up point as opposed to looking for super individuals, because super individuals can cost us money sometimes. Brilliant. <coughs> what a fantastic way to finish, Rose. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. I wish them best of luck for the rest of the calving season and, of course, best of luck for the upcoming breeding season. I'm away to take some notes from Hubert's farm to improve my own home farm and I wish you the best of luck and enjoy the rest of the night. <laughs>